Well said. Our next speaker is Alan Huber with uh, AmpTech, and he's going to talk to us about the development of detectors for handheld X-ray fluorescence. Alan? Good afternoon. <clears throat> In 1991, Lee Grodzins came to AmpTech. We weren't too far out of his way, as we discovered that day. His company, Nighttime, was 200 yards away from ours. Lee came to us to ask with help with an x-ray detector. At the time, we had to tell him that we didn't know much about x-rays. Amtech was founded in 77 by John Pantazis and myself, and we were in the business of designing and uh, building instruments for the study of the Earth's charged particle environment. We had built 30-some spectrometers that flew in space and uh, looked at ions and electrons but never x-rays. Part of this work that was a challenge was developing small, low-power electronics to amplify the signals from detectors. Some of our instruments had many detectors, so these, that's why they, these uh, units had to be very small and low-power. So we looked around in the industry, and uh, we found nothing that was suitable for our use. We decided to develop our own line of hybrids uh, for this purpose, both for our own use and for the space, space science community. <clears throat> a hybrid in this context refers to, I can see this dot, I'm not sure. <laughs> and dot's not doing much for me. Uh, it, it's a, uh, a hybrid's built on a ceramic substrate with gold traces on it onto which are bonded bare electronic components, and they're all wired together with gold wire bonds welded in place. Then that entire substrate is uh, packaged in a hermetic metal package. This is an easy technology to get qualified for space because of its reliability. So we built these, and uh, we thought this was the ultimate niche market. We were surprised at the market for these devices, and especially we were surprised uh, that there were many ground-based applications for them. So when Lee came to Amtec uh, wanting to develop an X-ray detector, it was because he was aware of our A250 preamplifier, and he wanted to use this to build his detector. Uh, what were the requirements for this detector? They were pretty modest by today's standards. He only wanted to use the L lines of lead at this time, uh, this limited the energy range to about 10 kV. He needed uh, a little better than 1,000 EV energy resolution to adequately separate the lead L-alpha and beta lines. And there were actually pin photodiodes available out there in the industry that had sufficient sensitivity. As, as you heard earlier, Lee had done some experimentation with these. <clears throat> so being good neighbors and being accustomed to uh, helping our, our users with our parts. We acquired a Hamamatsu seven square millimeter pin diode and connected it to the A250. We achieved a resolution of 1200 EV. It wasn't good enough for Lee's application of lead and paint, but we were encouraged and uh, we told them we'd get back to him. So we looked around at what was being done in the uh, industry, and you've heard a lot of this already today. We wanted to see if there were any other competing technologies that might work. So uh, we found that most of the portable, there were no handouts, but most of the portable applications, uh, instruments, used proportional counters. They had the drawback of 1,000 EV resolution, not much better than we had gotten with the pin. Uh, but there were some very useful instruments that had been developed. Probably the most impressive were the um, XMED instruments you've heard about, developed under Heike Sipala at uh, Otto Kampu, later Metarex. Uh, the <clears throat> these uh, weren't of interest to us because of the poor resolution. Uh, <clears throat> the spectroscopic detector of choice at that time was the uh, lithium drifted silicon detector called the Silly detector. Uh, the resolution in, the port in portable devices developed in the 80s was 170 EV, which was quite good. But this device needed a liquid nitrogen uh, cooling supply, and that meant it needed a doer in the probe. 
it was really not a suitable device for a handheld. Mercuric iodide looked like a promising material. It was in commercial use by Texas Nuclear. <clears throat> they were building uh, portables, portable systems with it. It has the advantage that it's a very high efficiency material because it's high Z, it's high efficient at high energies, but it has some poor charge collection characteristics. It, re the real problem was it's a volatile compound and it would tend to disappear. So the reliability problems caused it to be abandoned uh, later in favor of pin diodes. Two uh, materials that showed promise also were cadmium telluride and cadmium zinc telluride. These were also high Z materials, so they had good stopping power, but they weren't great spectroscopic spectroscopically at the low end. Uh, they had charge collection problems and tailing, and uh, their performance was not reproducible for one to the next, which was an important requirement. These materials have been improved subsequently, and uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the cadmium telluride later. A very good cadmium telluride is made by a, a Japanese company, Acrorad. So we decided after this that there really was a clear need for a small spectroscopic X-ray detector, and the silicon pin seemed like a good candidate. So <clears throat> it had, uh, it had a drawback of low band gap, which means it was going to be leaky and would need cooling, uh, but not too much cooling. It's low Z, so it's inefficient at high energies. But on the other hand, it has very good fast charge collection. It's a mature technology resulting from large investment in the semiconductor industry. And pin photodiodes for optical applications were already available as a starting point. So in 2012, we, in 1992, we began uh, the development of, of the pin for handhelds with hybrid technology, which we thought was the key to making them reliable and, and low cost. 20 years later, at this time, uh, in, in 2012, uh, you can buy detectors that have 125 EV resolution near the theoretical minimum, and they can handle more than a million input count rates per second. So this is a lot of progress over these years, and uh, for the purpose of this talk, we've divided it into several generations to talk about. What were the overall goals for this kind of detector? We wanted small size, low power for the uh, tight geometries and battery operation and handheld. We wanted high resolution to, do, to resolve closely spaced spectral lines. We wanted high count rate capability for fast analysis. This was not a machine that you could load up with samples and come back in the morning. If you were going to hold this in your hand and make, make an analysis, you wanted it to happen fairly fast. So that was always a goal throughout these years, to speed up the process. Uh, this meant you wanted high resolution at short processing times or peaking times. Uh, we wanted detectors with large area for high sensitivity when the not much flux was available. We wanted them to be operating over a wide temperature range for handheld applications and high ambience. Uh, we wanted clean spectra. Uh, this is a typical criterion for detector. Uh, low background, low charge collection artifacts, and low contaminate, contaminants. These are all things that compete with the analytes in the spectrum, so we try to minimize them. Uh, we wanted them to be very manufacturable, have reproducible performance, and be very low cost. So what is a pin detector? Pin, often hyphenated P-I-N, is a planar detector, which means it's made like most semiconductors in wafer form. Uh, the I in the middle stands for intrinsic uh, silicon, which is not really available. The actual diodes are made from very lightly doped end material, as close to intrinsic as we can get. On the top of the detector, let's see if I can do this. <laughs> On the top of the detector, there's an active area. Uh, this defines the active area. It's a, a P implant, P plus implant. Uh, and on the bottom of the detector is an N plus implant that just makes contact to the silicon. When a voltage is applied from the top to the bottom, uh, charge carriers are depleted from the eye, the, the lightly doped material. And uh, when, an, uh, when a photon enters the detector, it interacts, releases uh, holes and electrons, 
the holes and electrons are collected by the top and bottom electrodes, and in that process, a signal is generated which uh, passes to the charge amplifier. Uh, over most of this volume, the charge collection is very precise, very, very uniform, but the exceptions are around the guard rings at the edge, uh, right below and in the front surface of the detector, and at the back side, if it's not fully depleted, there's another bad region. So our first generation in 92, we adopted a package, a 12-pin T08, uh, we used a nickel cover with a beryllium window on it to pass the x-rays. And to cool the detector, we used a single-stage thermal electric cooler. Uh, we cooled the detector, the JFET, and the feedback components together because that way the sensitive node of the circuit did not have to come out of the package, which was very important. Uh, we got a delta T of 50 degrees C, which allowed the detector to operate at minus 25 in the laboratory, which seemed adequate. Uh, in this device, we used the uh, silicon pin photodiode from Hamamatsu. Uh, it had seven square millimeter area. It was 300 micron th thick, but only 200 microns could be depleted. Uh, there wasn't much motivation for the makers of uh, optical photodiodes to make the depletion layer really thick. Uh, this was a pretty good one compared to other ones that were available. We used an interfet commercial JFET and a 100 micron thick beryllium window. When we introduced this product, our customers immediately told us they needed electronics or they couldn't use it, so we developed the XR100 amplifier and the uh, PX2 shaping amplifier uh, and power supply. So these two units together with a multi-channel analyzer were a complete system. You could take a spectrum. The result of this generation, we demonstrated proof of concept. We could make a useful detector. Uh, we found that uh, when we sold many uh, units to lab users, we found that the noise was dominated by the internal feedback resistor in the preamplifier, which was good because that gave us a direct path to improvement. Uh, and the applications were limited by its resolution and count rate capabilities. But the good news, we had successfully met our initial goal. We had 600 EV resolution, which was good enough for lead and paint. Uh, the second generation um, in 1994 we got, wanted to get rid of the resistor noise, so we took the resistor out of the package and developed a transistor circuit inside the detector package to do the reset. And uh, this effectively eliminated the resistor as a contributor to the noise, and the resolution immediately went down from 600 EV to 250 EV. Now you can see the manganese K alpha and beta lines well resolved. Uh, this is an example of an americium 241 spectrum that we took for Lee with the first attempt we made. And the bottom is with the current generation. You can see the great progress. Uh, the, f the first applications at this time, this was really our first practical detector. Uh, we sold many to academics. It became adopted for NASA's Mars Pathfinder mission and near missions. Uh, the Pathfinder mission was a huge plus for Amtech, um, a lot of publicity. This is uh, the uh, spectrum that came, first spectrum to come back from Mars of Barnacle Bill the Rock, sent to us by Tom McConaughey of the University of Chicago, one of the PIs. And in 1994, we received the R&D 100 award for this development. Uh, this time, we, got, we started to get the commercial applications, which were our goal. Uh, Metarex was our first user in an XMET machine for alloy analysis. Then uh, the, the detector became used for lead and paint by SciTech, Nighttime, and Oxford, and these were actually the first handhelds. Uh, lead and paint was a great application. There were few overlapping elements. The handheld was needed, as we anticipated, uh, for making all these measurements in a home. And, uh, 
that was just a very large market. We sold thousands of them, which gave us a little capital to uh, continue the development of these devices. The shortcomings that we saw in the device, uh, if you use it outside on a hot day, the resolution would degrade. We couldn't hold that good temperature uh, at, at very high ambience. The resolution also degraded with higher count rates. And these were both bad for our users because their algorithms uh, that Stan was talking about like to see uh, constant resolution. So changing resolution was not a good thing. They also had limited energy range. Uh, at the high end, the 200 micron depletion depth wasn't great. It was uh, a little too thin. And at the bottom end, uh, the 100 micron beryllium window was attenuating the soft x-rays. So this detector was really useful or uh, sensitive between 2 keV and 20 keV. Uh, but we were getting now some serious user feedback, especially from OEMs. Uh, so we made many improvements. In 1996, we did better cooling. We uh, developed a new feedback technique. We developed a new line of detectors that were all designed for x-rays rather than optical photons. And we did internal collimation to reduce the artifacts and clean up the spectrum. For the thermal redesign, we went to a two-stage thermal electric, electric cooler. Uh, this required a vacuum enclosure to take advantage of it. They, they don't work so well with an air load. So uh, we had to develop the technology to vacuum seal these devices, and uh, we used a hermetic welded seal and a hermetic uh, beryllium window, and we got down to less than a millitor pressure inside. We achieved the delta T of 90 C, which would allow operation at a good operating temperature of minus 35, as high as 55 ambient. So suddenly the detector was practical in hot environments encountered by the handheld in the field, and it provided uh, a margin for temperature stabilization. The, the detector could be kept at constant temperature over a very wide ambient range. The new detectors we developed at this time, uh, we needed more depletion depth. Am I supposed to go back with the other button? How do we go back? There we go. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, the new, new detectors uh, were 500 microns thick for two and a half times less capacitance. They were two and a half times as efficient at high energy. Um, and they had full depletion, so we got rid of the artifacts that were happening at the back of the other detector, the Hamamatsu. So a customer could choose uh, between the 5, 6, 13, and 25 millimeter size. Uh, and there were handheld applications developed for each of these. At the same time, we adopted a pulse reset preamp. This was an idea that was being used in silly detectors. We couldn't use the circuit that was used in sillies, so we adopted a concept by Radica uh, that he came up with in 1968. And I'm not aware that anyone else ever used this technique, uh, but it's fairly simple for a, a detector with positive bias. All you do is raise the voltage on the detector, the bias voltage, and then lower it. We do that in 100 nanoseconds, and that pumps charge through the capacitance of the detector and uh, resets the preamplifier. That's done periodically to bring the preamplifier back to an operating point. So there's no DC feedback in this. Uh, this th this uh, technology uh, required no additional components, which would normally add noise to the input. Uh, this improved the resolution drastically, again, from 250 down to 185 EV. And more importantly, it increased the rate. Our users were quite happy that now 
they could go to very high rates without degradation of the resolution. It would stay relatively constant. Uh, we went to a wider energy range. As I said, the depletion depth increased the upper end. We went to windows as thin as 8 microns. Uh, so now we had uh, a detector that could operate from uh, aluminum, the K lines of aluminum down at the 1.25 up through 10 antimony and up to 30 kV with good efficiency. So this was a big expansion of the useful element range. At the same time, we reduced the artifacts. We optimized the de detector entrance layer for x-rays. We recognized that a lot of the artifacts and a lot of the background were occurring at the edge of the detector near the guard rings. So we developed a silver collimator that would sit over that area and prevent events from occurring there. Uh, a little later, we recognized that the silver collimator was contaminating the spectrum. So we went to a multi-layer collimator based on a tungsten substrate with chromium, titanium, and aluminum uh, layers, coatings over it. And each coating would uh, suppress the, the x-rays from the previous layer. So this has very little uh, sp uh, sp signature in the spectrum. We made many custom configurations for the industry at this point, different preamps and different mechanical designs. Uh, our early users of this product were uh, art and archaeology uh, researchers, and you can see here Michelangelo's David being inspected with a portable analyzer made in an Italian laboratory. And uh, the spectrum over here shows that uh, the, salt, the sulfur, which is corrosive to the statue, has been removed by their cleaning technique. We also did a dual detector, cadmium telluride and silicon during this period. Uh, the idea was a thin uh, a pin diode would sit on top and low energy x-rays would mainly stop in the pin diode and get analyzed with uh, very good resolution. If I can find it uh, in this region. And the uh, higher energy x-rays would pass through the silicon get captured with 100% efficiency in the uh, cadmium telluride, and uh, they would be analyzed with quite adequate resolution. So this detector was used for lead and paint, where both the Ks and the Ls were analyzed, and it greatly speeded up that application. The fourth generation, uh, we simply adopted a better JFET. The JFET is the uh, one of the um, aspects of the detector that determined the resolution. And uh, we went to a four-terminal device, which was in a family of devices uh, developed by Tofik Nashashibi. Uh, you might have heard earlier about a pentafet that he developed, but this is a related device, a little different design. <clears throat> and the advantage of this FET is it has a very high ratio of transconductance to capacitance. Transconductance is gain. And this gives uh, low noise at short peaking time. And now our resolution went from 185 to 149. So this made uh, analysis about two times faster. It reduced the measurement time. Um, there were parallel developments uh, critical for handhelds that were going on at this time. And I wish I had more time to talk about them. Uh, digital processors were improving. And they increased the throughput uh, quite a bit. And they let a user tune for high, um, high rate or high resolution. So the advances in, in uh, digital processors were very important during this time. And also small x-ray tubes were being used. And they could generate the high fluxes that could make use of the detector and the, and the electronics. So all three of them, the detectors, the processors, and the x-ray tubes together, were driving the technology very rapidly at this point. And uh, the, the, the timing was good. As these technologies improved, the Ross Wee application came along uh, looking for toxic metals in consumer goods. And the high rate uh, of this, these uh, detectors and electronics provided very fast screening, which is, was essential for this application. Thousands of units were sold, and, and many new handheld applications uh, developed as well. 
On the right, you see a measurement of um, platinum in a ring. So in 2007, we knew the pin diodes were near their performance limit. The capacitance of the electrode would, would determine the, the uh, noise and the resolution. So we went to the SDD to solve that problem. The SDD uh, was a concept that was proposed in some form in, in 1983 by Emilio Gatti of the Polytechnic Institute of Milan and Pavel Rehak at Brookhaven National Lab. And uh, in it, there's no longer a large collecting electrode that sits over the whole active area. Instead, there's a very tiny little collecting electrode we call the anode in the center of the detector. and um, there are, there are means used to create a radial lateral electric field through the silicon, which will guide the electrons to that anode in the center. So all the electrons get collected there. Uh, this was this technolo te technology was developed by Joseph Kemmer and his colleagues at the Max Planck Institute and Keytech, his company, and uh, also at the Brookhaven National Lab, and, and a, lot of, a lot of contributions were made by the Polytechnic Institute in Milan. The picture shown here is of one which has the first FET, the uh, JFET, integrated into the silicon in the middle. Uh, this was a great idea. It produced very low noise, but there were count rate effects at the time, so the resolution would degrade with count rate. So we decided we wouldn't try to make uh, a FET in the middle of our, our, JFET, our, our SDD. We would use a discrete FET. We designed an SDD based on published literature, advice from Rehux Group at Brookhaven, and in-house device simulations with the Silvaco software. Uh, our first SDD was fairly conservative. It had a seven square millimeter active area. <clears throat> And you can see here a simulation of the electric fields inside. These are equal potential lines. And you can see the path of a, an electron, the, the black path there, uh, is a potential minimum in the detector along which the electrons flow until they hit that anode in the middle and are coupled to a preamplifier. Uh, along the surface are rings which establish that, uh, that electric field, radial field. Uh, we also reduced the artifacts by adding shielding around the detector. Uh, we made the detector very easy to use. Uh, the interface was nearly identical, so a user of a pin diode could switch over quite easily. We put the resistive dividers that were needed inside the can, unlike some earlier SDDs, so only a single bias had to be applied and there was no tuning of voltages. And with this detector, we got resolutions around 135 EV at a much higher count rate than the pin detectors. But in, in 2009, we wanted to increase the sensitivity, so we went to a bigger SED. It's a characteristic of the SDD that you can make it larger without affecting the noise very much. You can get the same resolution as you make it larger. So we, we did a newer, uh, a better design, uh, three and a half times as big, 25 square millimeter. Uh, we actually lowered the leakage, even though it was bigger. Uh, so it could be operated at higher temperatures. Uh, we improved the design, device design for better charge collection, and we got a better JFET for it that better matched the, uh, the low capacitance. So here's the result, uh, 125 EV resolution. This is a, both a log and a linear plot. I like the linear plot since there's nothing down at the bottom. Um, but uh, it also has an 8,500 to one peak to background ratio, which we were quite happy with. Uh, this shows the stability of resolution over count rate. You can run it very fast and get, get a 220 EV resolution at the top. Uh, and you, that, that resolution is stable out to almost three million counts per second. At the bottom end, we have 130 EV resolution and that goes out to about uh, 300,000 counts per second without degrading. So this generation had higher count rate, better statistics, better limits of detection, faster analysis in general. 
Uh, the better resolution is most important at light elements, so it's opened up the possibility of uh, vacuum and SEM measurements of very light elements. Uh, this on the left is a sulfur and oil spectrum where you can see the sulfur K alpha and beta lines. And uh, on the right is an automotive analyzer, which we show because it has many elements which overlap with previous detectors but are clearly defined here. So the state of the art now, uh, pin diodes you can get with uh, 50, 150 EV resolution, six square millimeter, and they can go to 100,000 counts per second. We can, you can get silicon drift diodes, which have a resolution as good as 125 EV, and they can go to very high current rates over a million a second. And tens of thousands of silicon pin and SDD detectors have been used in handheld XRF at this point. Uh, this summarizes, summarizes the path not as smoothly as the way uh, Lee drew it. <laughs> the path of improvement, we started out at about 850 EV at the top, and now we're down very close to the theoretical minimum of 119. And the count rate, we could go up to about 5,000 at the beginning on the left, and uh, now we can go up over a million counts per second. So what's next? Uh, this development is not stopping. We want a larger detector area for higher sensitivity, a 40 square millimeter device, which will be faster analysis uh, when the flux is not so high. We want an expanded energy range, higher efficiency for lighter and heavier elements, and we want uh, improved uh, FETs for improved electronics for performance. Um, the low energies, we're doing silicon nitride windows. Uh, you can see that silicon nitride uh, is able to see carbon, and uh, there are a couple of versions of it, but it's much better than any beryllium window below the silicon line. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to thicker one millimeter thick SDDs. They have performance virtually identical to the old one uh, down below 10 kV. You can see up at 25 kV that the uh, Sensitivity is about twice as high. The peaks are about twice as high. Uh, we're working now with the CMOS preamplifier. We hope to have this available in the next few months. Um, and the advantage here is, is not ultimate, better ultimate resolution, but rather optimized performance at short peaking time. At one microsecond here, you see the resolution of of the old device is about 150 EV, and the resolution of the new device is 130 EV. So we've made great progress. We've, uh, over in 20 years, we have much better resolution, wider operating temperature, very clean spectra, uh, reprodu reproducible performance, and uh, we think pretty low cost. So this has been a challenging but rewarding field to be in all these years. Uh, this talk is focused on Amtec's efforts in developing detectors for handheld XRF. We'd like to recognize and acknowledge the efforts of others in this field, specifically Keytech, PN Sensors, MoxTech, and SII, formerly Radiant. Uh, we also recognize and thank our many customers for their encouragement and their feedback, which have been critical to continued progress. And a special thanks to Lee Grodzins, who set us off on this path. Uh, thanks also to the organizers of the Water Symposium for giving us an opportunity to talk to you today. We do have time for a question or two for Alan, if somebody has one. Uh, can we turn the lights on? I'm not sure I could see anybody <laughs> if they had them. Well, the charge collection is, is not good. 
It has charge collection problems. Yes, there, there are defects in it, which cause traps, which cause uh, poor charge collection. Yeah, well, what do you mean intrinsic? You can get good results at low energies now with them because <clears throat> the electrons have good mobility and lifetime, and they go down to the positive electron on the bottom, and the holes go up, and they don't have to go very far. If it's a, uh, a low Z, low energy X-ray, but uh, the ones that develop at the back of the detector, the holes have to go a long way, and they're not uh, the spectra are not as good. But they're very useful at higher energies. You, would, you saw the distortion in that peak at the high end. I believe we probably want to move on if we can.